Good evening and welcome to the sixth and final of the Gifford Lectures series at the University of St Andrews in 2021. For those of us who've uh, been uh, following along this series, you'll know that we're coming to the end of a uh, terrific sequence with uh, Professor Oliver O'Donovan on the, the title The Disappearance of Ethics. And this, the final lecture, will be entitled The Spirit and Recovery of Agency. My name is Professor Oliver Crisp and I'm a Professor of Analytic Theology here at the University of St Andrews. I will be chairing this evening's session and overseeing the question and answer session that we have after a Professor O'Donovan has given his lecture. The previous lectures have been on the missing object, the good, the missing frontier time, the missing agent, the person, creation and the recovery of reality and law and the recovery of history. Let me welcome all of you who are joining us tonight, whether you are locally or from further afield, and especially if you're joining us from far flung places around the world. Um, and let me uh, welcome you to our uh, lecture this evening. Um, before I hand over to Professor O'Donovan, I'll say a few words about him and about the lecture series. As I'm sure you're all aware, this prestigious series was uh, started by the bequest of Adam Lord Gifford in 1888 and has been going ever since, a bequest that pertains to the four ancient universities in Scotland and has a great long list of extremely prestigious uh, previous lecturers um, to, to, to which you can uh, be referred if you visit the website. Professor O'Donovan has had a long and distinguished career, um, both in the University of Oxford and at the University of Edinburgh. He was Regis Professor of Moral and Pastoral Theology at Oxford from 1982 to 2006, and then took up a Chair of Christian Ethics and Practical Theology at New College in the University of Edinburgh from 2006 to 2013. He is one of the most uh, important Christian ethicists and political theologians working today, and his list of publications are well known, including Resurrection and Moral Order, Desire of the Nations, The Ways of Judgment, and his most recent Ethics as Theology trilogy. It's our great pleasure to have Professor O'Donovan with us this evening, and we look forward to hearing uh, the final lecture in his series, The Spirit and Recovery of Agency. Thank you, Professor O'Donovan. Thank you, Professor Crisp. We have been speaking of a moral fulfillment of history. That's an idea that can be developed in a number of ways through the idealist proposition that the goal of history is freedom, through the nomistic proposition that it is complete obedience, and through the quietist proposition that it is complete enjoyment. To gather these aspects together, we can describe the end of history as justification. Justification means, and can only mean, the justification of agency, divine agency and human agency. The justification of human agency entails judgment on failed agency, failure of will, failure of performance. While the justification of divine agency is the demonstration of the moral hospitality of the created universe. Dietrich Bonhoeffer referred to the profound secret of history as a whole, that free action as it determines history, recognizes itself ultimately as God's action. Now, the disappearance of the personal agent from the themes of ethics, a disappearance of which Shaler complained, corresponds exactly to an eclipse of the sense of agency as being both human and divine. Divine agency can seem to be incompatible 
with human agency. That has sometimes happened in some expressions of the doctrine of grace, which gets stuck in the destructive alternative. Either God acts or the creature acts, but both cannot act. Divine and human agencies then seem to compete, as it were, for the same limited space of self-determination. Such a competition between an infinite and a finite agent can only end badly. Either creaturely freedom turns out to be chimerical, or God absents himself in order to make room for it. This self-absenting may sometimes be accounted for in terms of separate ontological levels, parallel universes of infinite action and finite action, which never join up or interact. But that is a false trail. Action is necessarily determinate, which is to say it's finite. There's no action that does not begin at one point of time, end at another point of time, have particular effects producing this rather than that. There's no action that does not intervene upon other action, enable, support or frustrate other action. So language about the action of God speaks not of an infinite action which would be absolute, universal, have the same effects on all events equally and without distinction, but of an infinite being as engaged in finite ways in a finite world. A first or last act might be thought of as infinite, an act of creation or an act of decreation. But within the history of the world, as Bart says, God gives himself time, space and opportunity to act. And then he goes on very importantly, we have to speak of an analogia operationis, an analogy of action. God operate, occupies the same framework as human agents by analogy. That is, he performs some deeds and not others. He resists some purposes and supports other purposes. He shapes the universe of possible and actual actions by bringing about his final purpose in which human activity is accounted for. A goal of history or the will of God. Now, it's only mechanical force that obeys the law that the greater always swallows up the lesser. And it is a mechanical model of agency that creates the false dilemmas that have sometimes been associated with the theory of grace. The current of a river absorbs the energy of its tributaries, a wall absorbs the momentum of a vehicle crashing into it. Agents, even agents with very different powers, do not absorb each other. And the proof of this lies in that most familiar of human experiences, cooperation. Two or more wholly free agents cooperate, exercising a common agency to a common goal without loss of the integrity of either. Now, not only is cooperation perfectly familiar to us, it is in fact the primary experience we have of acting. From the baby who learns to walk by being held under the arms by parents, to the dying patient who sips water from a cup held to his lips, 
our experience of action is that of doing things together with people. The solitary agent, the lonely poet composing verse among the crags and the streams is the exception. And even that exception, as Wordsworth takes trouble to point out to us, is only apparent. All civilised activity is founded on the principle that acting together enhances the effectiveness of the participating agents. St Andrews University prevent, presents Gifford lectures. So does O'Donovan. And yet there is only one set of lectures between the two of them. There's nothing here that should puzzle us particularly. We need not locate the university and the lecturer on different ontological planes. And why not? In order not to have to skimp these very important remarks at the end, just take the occasion to notice those whose cooperative work has actually made these six lectures possible. The principal and the Gifford Committee, whom I have to thank for the invitation. The School of Divinity for its hospitality, the chairs of the different lectures from Divinity and Philosophy. And especially Dr. Robin Beret for her tireless work behind the scenes to make sure that it all happened. And Colin Reed for his support of the technology. And then, of course, to all those who have listened and have sent in questions. All these agents have worked together to produce whatever effect these lectures may have. It's been very encouraging, but not particularly puzzling from a philosophical point of view. It is simple, familiar cooperation. But cooperation has sometimes been suspect, particularly cooperation between human beings and God, though sometimes also cooperation between different human beings. It's been suspect because of a misunderstanding about equality. Cooperation implies a certain kind of equal freedom in the partners, but it does not imply an equality of power or function. If I possess one share in the one share in a corporation, then the larger shareholders will outvote me at a general meeting. And yet I have precisely the same freedom to attend the meeting or be represented and to ask a question. Complex cooperation always does depend, in fact, on differentiated roles and initiatives. If the lecturer is to be free to give Gifford lectures, the university, and it must be a Scottish university, must first to be free to invite the lecturer. There are many degrees of authority in cooperative relations. Students cooperate with teachers. Patients cooperate with physicians. Children with parents. Citizens with governments. Authority is involved in all of those cooperative relations. Only one form of cooperation is defined by the absence of authority, and that is pure friendship. A treasure in itself but it doesn't get everything done. That God is sovereign over history and the hearts of humankind does not detract from the freedom with which we align our wills with his will. It makes that freedom possible, in fact. So let us speak, always remembering that it's an analogy, but it's an analogy that deserves some confidence of a cooperative agency of God and human beings in shaping history. Without this, there could be no human freedom to act at all. Well, a theological name for this cooperation is ready and waiting. It is the spirit. The Lord, said St. Paul, is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. By which, of course, he meant the freedom of perfectly ordinary human agents like himself to be 
fellow workers with God. The reference of the term spirit in the scriptures is famously fluid. It's predicated of the Godhead as a whole, as a quasi-definition of the divine milieu. It identifies the third person of the Godhead in Trinitarian doctrine, who bears witness to divine acts in history and evokes responsive participation. It refers to a historical breakthrough, the gift at Pentecost. It refers to the activity of God in creation. And spirit is a feature of human existence too. Sometimes theologians are embarrassed by this fluidity. It would be wiser to see it as the great strength of the concept of spirit. In the spirit we see divine agency both as promise and as fulfillment. Spirit names that dynamic in history that is not natural to human existence, but goes beyond the cyclical repetitions of nature. A purely natural anthropology is dichotomous. It's organized as physical and psychological. It has an outer sphere and an inner sphere, a body and a mind, whatever. To add talk of spirit is to point beyond that natural organization to calling and fulfillment in history. In John's gospel, the spirit dwells in those who receive it and has the mysterious name paraclete, which means called in support, giving encouragement. What talk of the spirit may contribute to ethics is to liberate it from the dichotomy between nature and ideal, between either describing regular patterns of human exertion that are entirely predictable, or describing aspirations for what is essentially unachievable. We may still be surprised today, as Johannes Fischer was a quarter of a century ago, that the spirit makes so little appearance in contemporary theological ethics. Yet, of course, some caution is needed. Invoking the spirit casually and without thought presents us with a famous temptation, that of making God in our own image. The spiritual is too easily conceived in terms of the inner structures of human nature. We may identify the spirit with any human power that we particularly admire, with communicative powers of language, capacity for social cooperation or leadership, intellectual comprehension, speculative thought, or perhaps with the socially unifying forces we describe as the spirit of a common enterprise or a community. We thus make talk of the spirit to conform to language about our nature. It represents nature's highest achievements, to be sure, but it's nature nonetheless. We project what we most admire about ourselves onto God. And by that route, we end up with a kind of nature divinity, though a very fastidious humanistic one. Talk of the spirit must begin somewhere else. It must begin with God's government of history, the inscrutable character of which exposes these self projections to humiliation by events. It is in history that the spirit is given to reveal God's purposes. Yet, God's action in history touches our creaturely nature, even in its most elementary forms. The spirit is described as the life giver. And if we ask what kind of life, 
we should answer the life of historical agency and therefore the life of nature too. Sir James Macmillan recently composed a symphony about the Holy Spirit. He called it Le Grand Inconnu and structured its three movements by images of elemental natural energy, wind, fire and water. Now we may be tempted to dismiss wind, fire and water as primitive metaphors. And that is because in the aspirations of human existence, we think of these vital energies as merely a foundation for goals of intellectual, moral and social achievement. In divine action, however, the order is entirely the other way around. The fulfillment of history, which is a moral fulfillment of history, realizes, as nature cannot realize, the triumph of life over death the healing of sickness, the resurrection of the body. In nature, energies come and go. The spirit gives them direction. They are not merely recurrent forms of being, but occurrences of being towards a goal that God has set. The wind, the fire and the water drawn into the context of divine action become historical events and deeds. Historical events, to be sure, bear meanings and invite interpretations. In another familiar pairing in the New Testament, the spirit is contrasted with the letter. Letters on a page are seen. Their meaning is not seen, but read. The divine voice in the motions of the soul and community is never merely a primary vital energy. It is an interpretation of vital energy. So it was no less fitting that Sir James's work on the Holy Spirit was a choral symphony dominated by voices, speaking or singing, both from God to creatures and from creatures to God. If we must accept the meaning of God's action as life, we must also accept that life is itself a meaningful communication. It speaks to us as it lives. The spirit who gives life gives freedom which implies a discernment of meaning in events. So life is not simply what living things possess by definition. It is an address, a word that challenges us to insight and to answer. The charismatic communities of the New Testament knew that the life of the spirit demands discernment, a communication of something that does not lie on the surface of experience. In the person of the spirit, we see the unity of life and understanding, the vital effectiveness of purposeful agency, which adds historical fulfillment to the gift of creative being. History takes on the form of good news, open to prophetic interpretation, centering on the Christological event. For the spirit, as Jesus says in God, John's Gospel, bears witness of me. A morality of nature, then, is never more than a preparation for historical experience of life lived in commitment to God's purposes. Even if we cannot believe that such a life is given us, because we live in time, we're still liable to imitate it with pseudo historical realizations of morality in materialist or political kingdoms of heaven, which ape the Christological disclosure in some way. From either point of view, a natural ethics looks like a conscious reduction 
Reduction, as we've said, is a heuristic technique to pursue focused and specialized inquiries. If there are reductions in moral knowledge, they will focus on special tasks of morality. Political concepts are, in fact, reductions of this kind. Postponing the ultimate decisions about what is good or evil to do in order to focus on a penultimate regime of law. Liberal rights, warrior hierarchies, landowner nobilities, work-based class solidarities, national loyalties, all these concepts serve a limited restricted function in managing and directing their societies. But when mistaken for ultimate moral truths, they become systematic illusions, artifices that conceal what we are and how we are placed in the world. So how then may we describe human agency in the light of God's promised fulfillment? Let us begin by speaking of faith. Faith, it cannot be said too often, is a noun of action. It refers to an action of the mind, an internal action involving as such no bodily movements, yet an active action not terminating in simple cognition of something, as when we contemplate a mathematical formula, but in a response to that something. Faith is the hinge by which the practical function of reason is suspended on the cognitive. It's a wholly commonplace action. We perform it all the time, usually without thinking. In English, it's conventional, though no more, to speak of belief in relation to the more commonplace forms of the act and of faith in relation to the more ultimate and weighty. But that distinction, unknown to many languages, is secondary. Faith in the strong sense is simply a special case of what human agents do. It is special because its object is special it is the perception that history has been given a fulfillment and a purpose, that conscientious action is assured of its vindication. And such a perception can be grasped only as the spirit makes God's work known. The act of faith responds to the promise of fulfillment, but it is also itself a part of history open to fulfillment. Two verbs are used by the New Testament to speak of the fulfillment of agency through faith. Two related verbs, conform and transform. Both point to a new shape that human agency assumes, not a shape given in human nature. That shape or form has come to view historically with the appearance of the Christ. And it is to this manifestation that the human agent is conformed. It matters that we should be rather careful how we describe this. The Christ form involves complete self-dedication, obedience to vocation, sacrifice, it is a form of love and mercy, of courageously truthful decision and communication. It is also, in terms of its end, a form of death and of resurrection, of defeat and vindication. Any one of those descriptions of the Christ form and other possible ones, for what I've said is by no means comprehensive, may be decisively important for a given agent at a particular juncture in determining a particular course of action or an attitude. But no one of them is the formative form itself. The formative form is the personal life of the Christ. Each of these aspects taken in isolation is simply a formed form 
which is why so many general conceptual descriptions of the morally fulfilled life tend to sound hollow, sometimes sentimental, sometimes strident, because they lack the personal form that belongs to the Christ. Conformity is a discipline of practical thought that requires more than one leading idea to work with. What it is given and what it must conform to is a gospel narrative, a narrative that is capable of being expounded in many ideas, always many. The narrative of the historical figure is the final point of reference. It's consulted over and over again. It yields new angles and new challenges. There is another mistake to avoid. The narrative is not simply performable, inviting a kind of reenactment, as though the earth could be constantly repeopled by copies of Mary Magdalene or Pontius Pilate or John the Baptist or Jesus himself, so that we could each, as it were, sign on to play a well-known role and know what that role contains. That would deny the form its power as promise. It would reduce it to repetition. Life in the wake of the Christological disclosure of history is still unscripted. The Christological form allows new answers to new questions, answers in harmony with past questions and answers, but never simple reenactments. The gift of the spirit of Pentecost, we are told, was experienced in a community of faith in the Christological narrative as it explored its new gifts of tongues and charisms, powers of articulate speech and mutual service, all in the wake of the Christological event, exploiting the possibilities that it had opened up. Now, the form of Christ is a term that recurs constantly in the tantalizing drafts left by Dietrich Bonhoeffer for his never written Ethics. It's prominent, especially in the early essay, Ethics as Formation, where the form of Christ is the first reality of Christian ethics to which all other forms of moral deliberation are subordinated. It is the cunning of serpents, Bonhoeffer tells us, to look for good and evil, not in actions, which may be wholly deceptive, but in persons who, in the crisis of his day, Bonhoeffer tells us, were like saints and villains out of Shakespeare walking about in broad daylight. I presume he meant Richard III and Macbeth, not Beatrice and Benedict or Bottom, but saints and villains. In the burst of intellectual energy let loose by his reaction to the coming of war, Bonhoeffer seems to inhabit a positively apocalyptic moment at which reality unveils itself, he says, and instead of grey on grey, which had been Hegel's way of describing the work of philosophy, the brilliant flash and the impenetrable darkness of a thunderstorm surrounded him. The form of Christ required the simplicity of doves, an undivided gaze on God and reality. Reality meaning what God is accomplishing in the world. Ethics must point to Christ and cry, Ecce homo, behold the man. The philosophical and theological tradition of ethics in the West, von Herfer held, had been at fault for elevating normative principles. The influence of Scheler, whom Bonhoeffer read, is clearly dis discernible in that judgment. In reacting against Kantian universal prescriptivism, Bonhoeffer was undecided as to whether ethics was tied to the Kantian paradigm and therefore 
essentially unredeemable or whether it could be refounded theologically. Different answers to that question are found in different essays. At the apocalyptic moment, the very idea of a Christian ethic seemed to him to be little more than a subversive paradox. But in later fragments, ethics prepares the way for the ultimate by caring for the penultimate. Moral reason comes closer to reality than blind will. And a new kind of discernment, encompassed and pervaded by the commandment, brings intellect, cognitive ability and attentive perception in context into lively play. Yet through these uncertainties of a fertile mind denied the opportunity to pull its insights together, one thesis is always maintained quite clearly. Human moral reason can and must assume the form of the decisive moral fact of history, the life and death of Jesus Christ. So much for conforming. What then is meant by transforming? Two indicators must suffice, both drawn from the Christian rite of baptism. The seal of the spirit, as it is traditionally described. In the first place, baptism reconciles the individual agent with the acting community. In the second place, it reconciles the immediately present self with the moral future. Existence in community is natural, not artificial. So is cooperative action. Personal identities are formed by interaction. We never begin and we never cease to identify ourselves by reference to those around us. But communities are historical entities, not timeless wounds. Identification extends to actions taken collectively, and we affirm our identities by sympathy with others' actions and alienation from them. Communities too are agents and find themselves cooperating with or resisting other communities. And that too is the ground of the uneasy relation that societies have with their individual members. Alienation, playing out the conflict of Socrates against the laws of Athens, is not an expression of pure individuality, but of an unhappy form of socialization. The difficulty of thinking the individual in society is not a difficulty with the common origin of individual and society, but with the, their common destiny. The individual self-consciousness tends to separate itself, to step apart, to define its goals over against those of community. So how is the individual to be fulfilled in community and the community fulfilled in its individual members? Most modern political thought has had the goal of producing an answer to that question, starting either from individual aspirations and conceiving community as a kind of agreement to realize ends in common, or starting at the other end. Baptism is the foundational moral act by which the individual embraces a personal vocation as an identification with a community. Each baptized person seeks self-realization in the common moral identity into which he or she is inducted. And this common identity is initially that of the church, but ultimately that of the human race of, which, of the redemption of which the church sees itself as the first proofs. Bonhoeffer describes this foundational relation of the community as a representative relation in which each member stands in for the other, as Christ stands in for the human race as a whole and its destiny. Now, such a term is liable, of course, to be misunderstood. 
taking the identity of another person in preference to my own can only be a task that is given to me, not one I simply take on for myself. Mutual representation can never found a community, but a community may be the foundation of mutual representation. The church constructed by the representation of Christ lives in mutual representation. It comes to reality at the Christological moment, together with the actor who made that community possible. It is often called the body of Christ. And baptism imprints a new beginning of life to one who is already living life. It is a beginning distinctly appropriate to realizing moral agency. It is formed by repentance and faith, consciously reflecting on the defects in which we unreflectively exist and appealing to God for a good conscience. We speak of conversion, understanding that term to refer not primarily to a biographically contingent crisis, an event that may mark one person's experience but not another person, but to an essential moment in agency itself. The idea of a moral conversion was already shaped by philosophy before it became a radical religious idea. And when it did the latter, it was characteristic of pagan mystery religions as well as of Judaic monotheism. All ideas of conversion, philosophical and religious, associated with the recognition of the reality of death. The moral anticipation of death, like conversion itself, is a theme of ancient philosophy, which counseled it as a means to overcome the terror of extinction. Death was the ultimate demoralizing force. It brought the exertion of moral agency to nothing. Now, what such Jewish figures as John the Baptist added to that set of concerns was to associate them with the idea of a fulfillment of history. When doubt over the form of history has subverted moral confidence, then the new beginning becomes a statement of faith in the accomplishment of history. It imprints on the action of the individual the form of the Christological moment, appropriating its promise for agency in the light of the resurrection. Future history lays claim on us as individuals, we acknowledge its claim. Our immediate prospects may be obscure. Our time on Earth may be short. And yet the future makes a demand that does not depend on actuarial calculations. Whether for years or for minutes, we have a duty of continuing, of sustaining our moral sight, of resisting the tendencies of natural being to forget what it has been given and promised. The New Testament category of endurance focuses on that task. Granted a moral direction in the gift of life, we are to maintain it against difficulties, both internal and external. The world, that is the purely routine and expected, the flesh, the tendency to lose the capacity for effort and aspiration, and the devil, the threat of meaninglessness that dissolves all purposes, these expose us to loss of direction. And perhaps there's nothing of which late modern moral scepticism has left us so hauntingly doubtful as whether an individual can be one and the same person from one end of life to the other end. Yet that can be no more than a doubt, for the thesis of personal discontinuity itself simply cannot be thought through to a consistent conclusion. Some continuity is an elementary condition for thinking at all. If I ask whether I'm still the same person that I was, 
my question is badly formed. The right way to ask that question is, how can I come to envisage my life as a moral whole? To see oneself in that light is something very close to the classical ideal of eudaimonia, happiness, which as we know so long thought can only be attributed to a life that was over. And Augustine agreed, though in a very different sense, could only be enjoyed in a state of eternal rest, finally. When we're old, it's difficult to recall the details of our past life. When we're young, it's difficult to imagine the details of the life we have yet to live. Even when a life is over and done with, it's difficult for a third party to see it whole. Consider the problems faced by the literary art of biography. It was the focus of great moral hopes at the beginning of the 20th century, predicted to replace the novel as the dominant medium of moral instruction. But the novel had picked all the low hanging fruits of morality. It had focused on crises that would force a character to choose, on trials and influences that would draw it out from its social background to emerge as a definite person. And after it had reached that point, they lived happily ever after, and that was the enemy. Biography had to wrestle with a much harder task of imagining the excellence of a human life from birth to death. The early chapters of a biography, trawling through domestic and educational trivia, the closing pages detailing the ravages of old age and declining health. Now, those are the real tests of a biographer's capacity to unify a life around its moments of greatest significance. Youth and age pose the most difficult questions to life as nature intrudes in obvious ways on historical existence. And it's perilous, I would say, to conceptualize the human biography around a notional central point of adulthood, a time of achievement. When we can have the illusion that those questions are in abeyance, though of course they're not. Karl Barth showed his usual insight in identifying the question of the shape of our lives as a perennial sign of the providential work of God in sustaining nature in history. A life is one act. Its consistency must be evident if it's to be unified. Yet it's constantly involved in irreversible changes, some natural, some moral. It must have a beginning different from its end. It must have a direction leading from one end to the other without going round in circles. A personal life is not one in the sense that a natural organism is one, or as a historical fact is one. Once transacted, the historical fact is thereafter fixed and unchangeable. The portraitist can adopt the observer's point of view on the subject as a historical fact. Just think of Holbein's Henry VIII, a very complex depiction with many references to imagined or actual realities of 16th century absolutist absolutism, all brought together and concentrated in one personal figure, fixed in a posture that declares the unarguable facticity of political power. Yet the unity of that fact is not the unity of the living person. When Jesus was asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer looked for and given was about how to live in a definite direction. All was on the move and changing. Eternal life that is sought 
is sought, to be lived eternally, and therefore always as a goal. But it is not an alien goal, a horizon of becoming something else, a chrysalis turning into a butterfly or something like that. It is an inheritance that follows the doing and the being of life as we have it, a conclusion that intricately unites the self's living experiences. One of Kierkegaard's shorter and less celebrated literary works, the engaging essay called Repetition, is guided by this single philosophical question. How can the life of an individual achieve self-sameness? Repetition is reality and it is the seriousness of life. That is the starting point. You're looking at a different translation of the same Danish sentence. But how can it possibly occur in the life of the spirit? Each experience we repeat is different next time. Merely recollecting and retaining the past achieves at most an anesthetizing uniformity, Kierkegaard tells us. Well, the answer he proposes is that self-repetition in self-transcendence is possible in acute suffering. Becoming oneself again is peculiarly reserved for the sufferer. Job, the paradigm, refuses to yield to the view of himself he is offered by his comforters. He clings resolutely to the self-experience in which freedom's passion in him is not smothered or quieted down by a wrong expression. He cannot repent what he has been, except before God, because only God can give him back what he has been in true self-knowledge. Looking to God to reconcile his past and his future, he reaffirms himself, ending where he began, but in a quite different way. He has received everything double. Job's sufferings, Kierkegaard encourages us to think, are by no means over. Though once grasped as a probation, they can be received and lived as a reward. Well, here we may be tempted to think is a modern version of the old Aristotelian Thomist account of character formed by repetition of acts that express given virtues. In fact, I think the modern account of repetition is importantly different. Where the older account had a pedagogical focus, viewing repetition as a training, a precursor to virtue, forming patterns that were eventually to become second nature, Kierkegaard is famous for treating virtue and its ethical ambitions as merely a precursor to faith. Faith is the true light of the spirit, the inner side of freedom. Job's established virtues belonged to the role he lost, not to his innermost life as a sufferer. New roles need new virtues, but faith repeats itself and in repetition, it acquires the form of faithfulness. It's time to look back over the journey we've taken in these six lectures. We've explored the dependence of moral reason on the being and time of the world, and our own role as personal agents within the agency of the divine spirit. Any talk of resurrection and moral order needs those points of reference. But they have a habit of disappearing from view, swallowed up by preoccupations with description, and ethics is then left homeless within the organisation of knowledge. Aspects of human existence 
do not disappear when they lack a home in organized knowledge. But if the claims of knowledge and existence pull apart too sharply, then our capacity for both is seriously damaged. Knowledge without a knower, existence without disciplined reflection and understanding, moral reason without reflective self-direction. These are the fragments of ethics that are left to us once the essential reference points have disappeared. At the beginning, I suggested that the relation of ethics and theology is near the center of topics generally included in natural theology. To say that is to claim an apologetic value for treating these two themes together. And responding to a suggestion kindly sent in by Dr. Amy Erickson um, of Canberra, I believe, I shall close with a remark about this apologetic strategy. Kant, whom we now mention for the last time, understood ethics as rendering an apologetic service to theology. The classic arguments for the existence of God based on motion, causation, necessity, possibility and form proved absolutely nothing, he argued. But moral reason presupposes the truths of God, the soul and eternal life. And while this can never be a proof of the propositions of theology, it is a reinforcement for faith that the promise of a goal of history in the divine purpose is a promise that ethics is inevitably on the lookout for. It is an interesting fact that in his lifetime, when challenged, Kant claimed to have simply underlined the Lutheran doctrine of justification by faith alone. Well, to Kant's uh, account of the apologetic service rendered by ethics to theology, I merely add that an apolog apologetic service conceived this way is inevitably mutual. It runs the other direction too. Theology, in teaching us to bless God for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, which is to say for nature, for history, for concrete personal and interpersonal existence, anchors us in an existential wonder without which ethics cannot begin and without which it cannot continue. And it therefore protects the inquiries of ethics from the very real and present danger of a disillusioned skepticism that can leave them looking quite pointless. To take a recent painful example, when we wondered how we were to live in the midst of a dangerous pandemic, the specialist knowledge of the epidemiologists and the virologists, important though it inevitably was, was clearly not sufficient to guide reasonable decisions. Following the science was a, limited, a limiting constraint for decision makers, but it was not a direction. Science has no direction that it has not already at some point borrowed from life itself. Science is simply the observation of natural regularities. In such a crisis, we have to reflect on our priorities for common life. And we reasonably expect ethics to come to our aid with some basic affirmations about what really matters in such a situation. But what guidance was ethics able to offer with its key points of reference always threatening to disappear? What we've seen, in fact, has been a familiar phenomenon. Assertions of value made with increasing stridency and insecurity. The priority of the protection of human life has been assumed and not reasoned. The resort to technology has been instinctive 
and not calculated. Our responses, undermined by the broader descriptions of biological reality, reality which are in currency, have been in constant unresolved tension with our other dominant cultural concern, which is the health of the wider planetary ecosystem. Nobody mixes talk of defeating the coronavirus and of protecting our biodiversity. And the reason they don't mix those talks is that nobody is clear how the two commitments can ever fit together. We've reached a point, in fact, where we can no longer argue with conviction in favour of what our cultural instincts tell us we ought to do in the face of such a crisis. The intellectual framework for the life project of the human race has shown its incoherency. And it is at that point that any service ethics may have been able to render theology must much more profoundly be repaid as a service rendered by theology to ethics. Theology, or to speak more precisely, the prophetic word of good news, comes to the aid of human moral reason where it feels the ground falling away under its feet. It assures it of the validity of moral thought in a world where the meaning of history is anything but perspicuous. Which is to say, theology comes to the aid of human existence itself. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor O'Donovan, for a very stimulating uh, final lecture in the series. We have some time now for uh, Q&A before we have to close. And as uh, our audience online uh, begins to tap in their um, questions to uh, the, the online function on um, Teams, may I, may I offer an opening question? Um, given the kind of shape of the lectures and where you were going with the account that you gave today, especially as you ended on the notion of ethics and as an apologetic for theology, uh, I thought I might ask the potentially naughty question to uh, a professor of many years of teaching in the university, which is, given that way of thinking about the nature of ethics and its shape, how does one approach the task of teaching theological ethics to undergraduates? Oh, I have no idea at all. Um, I, I spent 40 years trying to find that out. Um, and uh, right up to the end was deeply discontent um, with anything I could offer under the shape of a, a course, particularly an introductory course in ethics. Um, uh, partly because Increasingly today, one is speaking to, uh, uh, one, one is asking people to reflect on a kind of activity of moral reasoning in which many people have had very little exercise. The aim of such teaching, and the most important, is to try and give the student a sense of what it is like to occupy the posture of asking a moral question with a real need to know the answer mm -hmm. um, and to get out of the notion that it's all about um, comparing different theories of ethics. Um, one has to take people into a stance and then see what is on offer on the horizon for help in that stance. Um, that's the most I can say about teaching ethics, I think, uh, certainly in a short compass. Thank you very much indeed. We have a number of questions um, coming in here and uh, the first one we'll take this evening is from Andrew Errington who says this, you've said that a central thesis of Bonhoeffer was that human moral reason can and must assume the four of the life and death of Christ. You began these lectures by referring to your earlier book Resurrection and Moral Order and this lecture has traversed again some of the themes of its last part. Does your use of Bonhoeffer point to some ways in which your thinking has changed or developed with reference to the impact of the death of Jesus on ethics? Dr. Errington um, has uh, asked a, a very good question there and I think the answer is I probably have to admit that it has, um, though I 
I'm not conscious of having made any sharp turns, but I do think that I have found ways of expressing the relationship of moral action to Christology that are more varied and richer than I, uh, than I knew when I wrote Resurrection and Moral Order. I do find Bonhoeffer's language of the form helpful. I mean, I think it's a, it's a perilous language. I mean, it's a, it's a language that can be taken in so many directions that you might worry um, that it was too loose. But I, I, the more you press at it, the more I think you can see what he's doing um, with the notions of conform, conformate, conforming and transforming. And I am also very impressed uh, by the way in which very parallel thoughts were taken up by Balthazar. Um, I mean, those two are perhaps a strange pair to put together, though not entirely strange, both owing something to Bart in the background, though exactly what um, will be different. Um, uh, but the use I made of Balthazar's Christology, ethical Christology last time, I think, does have really interesting parallels with what Bonhoeffer is trying to do in the ethics. Excellent. Um, now we have a question here from, uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to pronounce his name, Slavomir Nowosad from the Catholic University of Lublin in, in Poland. And uh, the question is this, your Gifford lectures have obviously been in natural theology, as all Giffords are, or at least are supposed to be. It's very likely among your audience that uh, there has been someone not accepting a naturally theological outlook of life and ethics. Having come close to, to, to the close of your lectures, to those who do not believe in God, even naturally, is there anything you would add about ethics, life, and God? The name, the name of Professor Novosad is probably not known to many. Um, I should mention that he is a former dean of the Faculty of Theology in Lublin, and um, perhaps the leading, well, certainly I should think, the leading Roman Catholic expert on Anglican theological ethics. Um, uh, so it's very good to know that Professor Novosad has been tuning in and joining us in this exercise. I suppose I have accepted the position which um, has perhaps been the majority 20th century position that the use of reason to support belief in God is always indirect. It founds it, it gives it coherence, it spells out its shape. It is not a deductive train of thought from a premise to a conclusion. Uh, therefore, God exists. In which case, any project of recovering the classical arguments for the existence of God um, from the sort of destructive way in which Kant and many others have treated them will be a way of reframing them, of interpreting their insights in a non-deductive fashion to show how belief in God can find its rationality and develop its um, coherence with reason in these directions. Um, in the end, faith has to be an invitation and a summons from God the sovereignty of God in this matter, I am, sick, um, I am clear about. I do, however, think that there is, at this civilizational juncture, there is such a thing as the dilemma of the traditional conscience. That was a phrase coined by Basil Mitchell a generation ago to describe uh, what he saw as a large population of decently conscientious moral thinking people who could in the end give no final answer as to why they should be moral 
rather than simply cynical. Um, and I think this experience of knowing that it matters terrifically, uh, that certain moral principles are obtained, feeling very deeply and strongly about it, is an experience out of which, um, well, an experience that is going to bring us to the confrontation of a decision between faith and unfaith and can do as it's pursued. And th there is a very particular uh, address that needs to be made to such people, uh, of whom I, I have no reason to doubt are many, uh, though the culture does not favour them, and they feel that culture does not favour them. Um, the, the grounds on which they will hold to their ultimate moral convictions um, are not sufficient without help, without some kind of a ground in to justify their persistence with them. That's, I think, where the apologetic address comes and belongs. It speaks to those of moral goodwill um, who do not know what to make of their own moral goodwill. Jonathan Chaplin has a question. He says, a question about a theme running through the whole series. Is the overarching moral dynamic of historical and personal promise and fulfillment rooted in the original creation? Or does it arise from and is thus propelled by the need for a response to the fall, on which you've said little, which then necessitates the dynamic of moral redemption? It, um, let me let me chance my arm. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty clear what I need to say about this. Um, it belongs to creation. It is Creation is always the promise of a fulfillment. There is never a time, as it were, at which it was seriously possible um, that Adam and Eve would go on gardening forever. And that would be it. Um, uh, then God would reckon that it, the experiment had been a splendid success and he just let it run. I don't think that makes any sense. Um, it fundamentally what it doesn't make any sense of is providence and the notion of providence. Um, and, and, and the integration of creation and completion is fundamental to a sensible notion of providence, I would say. So having quoted approvingly Barth's little summary about um, covenant being the inner meaning of creation, yes, the promise fulfillment motif has to be there implicitly in the gift we are given. It's always a gift towards some further gift. Andrew Cameron from St Mark's National Theological Centre in Canberra in Australia asks or says this, thank you Oliver for a fascinating series and I very much appreciated your final passing of moral anxieties and confusions around the pandemic, but I wish to ask about spirituality. May we participate in burgeoning talk of spirituality? Is it a natural theology and inchoate yearning for the spirit? Or is it too inimical to life in the spirit as you've described it and too evasive of responsible agency to be of use? Well, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad Dr. Cameron asked this. Um, uh, this is, the, if you're going to write a lecture about the spirit. This is, as it were, the question that's in the back of your mind the whole time. How is it focused enough and how is it broad enough? Um, uh, I've done what I can with that. The term spirituality um, looks like, I mean, just from the way it's formed, looks like one of those classic attempts to take a historical concept and to turn it into some kind of pseudo law of nature. Um, uh, this is, of course, a habit of human thought um, that, that we're always engaging in. Um, when something happens, uh, something that is by its definition unique, we find reasons for it. Um, and if we're not careful, instead of just narrating it, 
saying, well, this happened and this happened because this happened and this happened because this happened. We end up by trying, as it were, to formulate a scientific law of the kind whenever conditions of this, that or the other kind of chain, then something of this kind happens. Um, there's a very famous example in the middle of um, just en passant, the middle of Maritain's Man and the State, in which he refers to the secularization of the state in, um, modern, in the modern West, and refers to this process, which by definition is something that has only ever happened once, as quite normal. Normal as what, one asks. Now, if you talk spirituality, you are beginning to talk, I think, the language of what is quite normal and to try to encompass the work of the Spirit of God, which is historic, into some concept of normality. Me and my inner self, um, the mind, the subconscious, and so on and so on, which will accommodate it. And I think the question is angling for me to say, and I say it gladly, uh, no, it won't accommodate it. Not if you treat it like that. Um, Guido de Graff of St. Augustine's College of Theology says this, I wonder about what you said concerning the analogy between human cooperation and divine and human cooperation. I appreciate your emphasis on it being an analogy, Yet I still wonder how this relates to what you reminded us of during the last lecture, I think, namely that the meaning of our works will only be revealed at the end, indeed primarily, as you stressed, in that second book referred to in Revelation. Does this second perspective stress the different levels on which human and divine action operate, if not, of course, in separation? Analogy is one of those words that covers a multitude of intellectual sins, isn't it? And I think you're asking me whether I have to um, confess to one or two of them here. I think my first move is simply defensive. I'm going to say at least once, possibly more times, that's exegetically discussable. The notion of human divine cooperation is quite clearly articulated in the New Testament. We've got to make something of it. Let's start by trying to understand that and not trying to get rid of it. Um, and so uh, that I think emboldens me to feel that what the New Testament can say, the theologian can echo. I mean, and if that's not the case, then theologians are in a funny position. Um, but at the same time, Understanding this form of cooperation is obviously uh, requires a sense of the difference as well as the sameness between uh, divine human and human human cooperation. Two people agreeing to do something together define fairly clearly to each other's understanding or should do what it is they're going to do. Um, one of the ways in which cooperation can break down is uh, unclarity about that definition that shows that something isn't shared. In what sense can we transfer that to the work of God? Well, I think we have to say that God has, that not only are God's purposes waiting to be revealed at the end, they are also in an important sense disclosed. That God has found his forms in which to speak to us of that to which our human lives are directed. Um, and here, perhaps, uh, it's, of, it's of special importance um, that the, the Christ event, the event of, of Christ's own life itself, is not only an event of obedience, of death, of resurrection, it's also an event of teaching and instruction, that there is a form. Uh, a communicable form. Um, you may find it in the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps, which, as it were, tells you, focus your intentions and purposes here, and you are in line with God's intentions and purposes. That may be an appropriate point at which 
for us to draw this to a close. Thank you very much, Professor O'Donovan. It remains for me as chair to offer some thanks to a number of people who've been involved in this wonderful series of lectures. First of all, let me thank Principal Sally Mapstone for her kind words of introduction at the first lecture and Lewis Wood for coordinating on behalf of the principal's office for the university. Uh, I'd also like to thank the lecture chairs who've preceded me, including uh, Dr. Stephen Holmes, Professor Judith Wolfe, Professor John Haldane, Dr. Andrew Torrance and Dr. Rebecca Lamb. And it would be remiss of us not to also thank those who've been doing all sorts of wonderful things behind the scenes. Um, including um, Rob, Dr. Robin Buer, uh, as well as the IT and events personnel at St Andrews who supported us behind the scenes, Colin Reed, Timothy Oldfield, uh, Lauren Sykes and Mark Cathro. Thank you so much for your help and support. And to all those of you who've attended and watched the lectures after the fact on YouTube and contributed to the rich conversation and thoughtful questions that have been fielded in the Q&A. Thank you so very much. But of course, uh, our final thanks must go to Professor O'Donovan himself for what have been a wonderful and insightful series of lectures this year. Thank you very much indeed, Professor O'Donovan, for sharing your wisdom on these matters with us. That concludes uh, our lecture series uh, at the University of St Andrews, the Gifford Lecture Series for 2021. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, Professor Donovan. <laughs>